In the previous lecture, we saw the matrix representation of the block equation. This is the general representation which helps you understand how the magnetization evolves as a function of time. We did see a case where what happens to a given magnetization M when no RF pulses are applied. In this case, we were able to see the time domain signal acquired in the transverse plane would be given by m plus of t will be equal to m plus of 0 meaning what is the transverse magnetization at time 0 multiplied by e power i omega t times e power minus r 2 t. This would be the oscillation that provides the frequency of interest and this is the relaxation parameter that results in the decay of the signal. When this time domain signal is plotted as a function of time We get an oscillation that decays over a period of time where the decay rate is e power minus r2t and the oscillations provide you the desired frequency. So this signal from here on will be referred to as the free induction decay. The free here stands for the fact that the magnetization that you end up getting ends up processing freely in the presence of the V0 field. Remember in this case there are no RF pulses applied. This freely processing magnetization induces a current in the coil that is detected in form of a signal that we see here. And this signal ends up decaying over a period of time due to the relaxation parameter. So hence the decay ends up coming up. So from here on when we refer to the FID we mean the free induction decay which is a time domain signal. And this signal when Fourier transformed help you get the spectrum of interest. When you have e power i omega t you get a resonance only at plus omega and not at minus omega. This is important because when you have multiple spins you need to have proper frequency discrimination for all of these spins. We also quickly introduced some aspects of Fourier transformation where the Fourier transformation of e power i omega t gives a Dirac delta function at omega and the relaxation part results in the Lorentzian and how did these two look? Basically you had 0 and you had plus omega you had signal and minus omega you had no signal and the Lorentzian gives you peak shape and when you convolute these two you end up getting the spectrum that we generally tend to see. One aspect that one has to remember this is the absorptive Lorentzian part. Remember you are doing a complex Fourier transformation. So you get two components. The real component is written here while the imaginary component will go as omega minus omega divided by r2 square plus omega minus omega the whole square. The omega is a running variable. When omega equals omega you have 1 over r2 that ends up coming and therefore this will result in a line width that will go as r2 by pi in ppm. If you try to plot the dispersive Lorentzian, you get something of this sort. And the important thing that you have to realize is that the difference between the maxima and minima will give you r2 by pi. Basically the maxima here occurs at 0, the 0 transition here occurs at 0. Of course both have the same amount of information but you are able to understand that the absorptive Lorentzian decays as 1 over omega square meaning that as you go farther and farther away in omega the function dies very fast but on the other hand the dispersive Lorentzian dies as 1 over omega resulting in very very broad shoulders as it goes away from omega. So therefore we tend to prefer absorptive line shapes in the field of NMR spectroscopy. Now let us consider case 2 application or of, of RF pulse. Here we assume the duration of RF pulse is much less than the relaxation times that we end up seeing. So let's take for an example the 90 degree hard pulse that we applied. We said the duration of the pulse is in the order of microseconds. Typically for small molecules P1 will be in the order of say 500 milliseconds which is half a second and T2s will be in the order of 1 to 2 seconds. The pulse is much much smaller in comparison to the relaxation delay. So therefore this is a fair assumption to have. Let's rewrite how the block matrix looks. 
So all the diagonal terms will go to zero. You have the off diagonal term which will be minus omega and uh, plus capital omega. Then you have omega 1 sine phi where phi is the phase with respect to the x axis. And since you said relaxation does not happen, you would also set R1 to 0. So you won't have the other term that we saw in the general equation. When this equation is integrated over the time, let's say of the application of the pulse tau p, this is represented as a series of rotations with respect to where you started with. What is this rotation matrix? Let us say you have a two-dimensional reference frame. You are rotating this entire frame to something like x prime y prime with an angle theta. So if you are trying to retrieve this old reference frame with respect to the new reference frame, x cos theta comma y sin theta. This will be 90 minus theta. Y prime will be x of cos of 90 minus theta comma y of y cos theta. And this gets reduced to sine of theta. Therefore, y prime will be x sine theta y cos theta. So therefore, if you want to represent x prime y prime in the basis of x y, you are going to have cos theta sine theta that comes from these terms and sin theta cos theta times x y where this sin theta comes from this term and cos theta ends up coming from this term. If you do a, uh, if you do a matrix multiplication you would be able to go from here to here. Here we did a clockwise rotation. So similarly if you do a counterclockwise rotation you would end up getting a minus sign here. So therefore these rotation matrices can be represented such as this R Z of beta. Remember in the example we did, we changed x and y to x prime and y prime. Therefore, the rotation is along the z axis. Therefore, anything with respect to the z axis will remain unchanged. And as I said, it's a counterclockwise rotation. So it's going to be minus sine theta and then sine theta cos theta. Since I'm using the term beta here, I'm writing it as beta. And therefore, R y of beta will be So let me write what is m at tau p would be given by although this expression looks quite huge and the matrices look daunting the single pulse experiment will help you understand how to apply this each of the pulses can be thought about as rotation around an axis let us say you are trying to apply a 90 degree pulse along the y axis that will be given as the rotation matrix along y with a 90 degree. So let's take an example. Say that we are starting from equilibrium and therefore m of tau p that is how does the magnetization look after the application of the pulse would be given by r y of 90 meaning that you are applying a 90 degree pulse along the y axis with the starting magnetization. For the sake of simplicity, we can take the starting magnetization as something like m0 along k. So how will this be written in the matrix form? It will be written as 0, 0, m0. So you're going to have y rotation and then sine of 90 that will be 1. Here you have sine of 90 and cos. So multiplied by 0, 0, m0 would give you First element would be m0, second element would be 0, third element would also be 0. So this indicates if you started along the z axis, you would end up along the x axis. This is nothing but counterclockwise rotation from the axis along y. The important thing that we assume here is that it's an on resonance pulse. That means your offset is 0. Let's continue with the same example where we set offset to 0 and instead of setting alpha to 90, we'll keep it at alpha degrees. Therefore, m of tau p will be equal to cos alpha 0 sin alpha 0 1 0 
sin alpha with a negative sign 0 cos alpha. And let's continue to say we started with the magnetization from equilibrium. So this will be equal to m naught sin alpha 0 and m naught cos alpha. You started from the z axis and now you are ending up along the x axis with a magnitude given by sin alpha and you still have some magnetization along the z axis if alpha is not 90, right? So 90 or even 270 for that matter. If you apply something like a 30 degree pulse and alpha equal to 30, you have something of the sort m naught by 2, 0 and m naught by 2. If you apply a 90 degree pulse, then you have m naught 0, 0. On the other hand, let us say you apply a 180 degree pulse, then the magnetization would be 0, 0 minus m naught, meaning that you have achieved inversion. So what you are seeing here again with the block equations is that you can understand that the magnetization ends up being rotated by the pulses that you apply. But this is not surprising because the magnetization ends up processing about the B field that you have applied. And of course, once you acquire a signal, let us say after 90 degree pulse, you will be able to understand this is what you started with T equal to 0, which gives you M plus or 0 will be equal to M naught. So let us recap a bit. Block equations were applied to two cases. Case 1, no R of pulse and case 2, R of pulse. Pulses rotate magnetization from their position and this can be approximated as rotation along the x or the y axis. Remember, we are always ta talking about counterclockwise rotation and what do we mean by that? Let us say this is your initial magnetization M0. Let us say you are applying an x axis pulse. The M0 will then, let us say pi by 2 along x on resonance would convert m0 along k to minus m0 along j. On the other hand, let us say you started with m0 along k and are applying a pi by 2 y pulse that will end up along m0 along i. Similarly, m0 along k, if you apply a pi by 2 minus x pulse, that will give you plus m0 along j. I hope you are able to appreciate the fact when I invert the face of the pulse where the magnetization ends up also gets inverted. After having reached, let us say you applied this pulse and you have reached a certain magnetization, then comes case 1 which is the influence of no R of pulse. At that time, M plus of T would be given by M plus of 0 times EXP I omega T EXP minus R 2 T. And we just saw a few moments back how you get the oscillation frequency and the relaxation rate from this free induction decay signal, which when Fourier transform give you a spectrum at capital omega with a line width of R2. So far, the cases that we have discussed has only single M0, but NMR is a linear spectroscopic technique, meaning that. Let us say you take the example of CH3, CH2, OH. You have three different M naughts, with one with respect to methyl, one with respect to methylene, the other with respect to hydroxyl. Each of this M naught that is present for these spins can be, let us say, we take as M1 of naught, M2 of naught, and M3 of naught. What ends up happening is that you get a signal for each one, M1 of m1 plus of t will be given by m1 plus of 0 exp i omega 1 times exp minus r2 of let us say 1 and at the same time m2 of t would be equal to m2 of plus at 0 time exp i omega 2 t exp minus r2 of 2 times t and m3 plus of t would be given by m3 plus of 0 exp i omega 3 t exp minus r2 of 3. 
times t. The best part of NMR as I said is a linear technique meaning that the m plus signal that you end up getting will be a sum of all these signals. So as in the example of methanol, let's say the methyl proton is 1, methylene is 2 and hydroxyl proton is 3. Then each one would give you signal that looks like this. And we had also imagined that we keep the carrier on the methylene proton and therefore let's say this is the carrier lower in frequency with respect to the carrier. So this is positive, this will be negative. Remember you will get it at minus 1000 hertz and M2 will be at 0 hertz and M3 will be at plus 500 hertz. The NMR spectrum will be a simple linear sum of all of this. So therefore you are going to get one at 500. be 0 plus 500 which will be the hydroxyl proton and minus 1000 hertz which will be the methyl proton and this is coming up in this fashion largely because you had set the carrier along the methylene proton and the methyl proton is up field with respect to the methylene proton and the hydroxyl proton is down field with respect to the methylene proton. So this is down field, this is up field. Let's say you take a sample and put it in the NMR spectrometer and run a simple one dimensional NMR spectrum, you will nicely get three resonances. As we go further in this lecture, you will be able to understand how the multiplicity ends up coming.